We are in the um, 26th chapter of The Path of the Just, the last chapter of the book, and we are in the trait of Kedusha, holiness. This is part two of, uh, of, the, of the book. We might, we might get finished with it today. We'll see. Um, up to this point, uh, the Ramchal has been talking about holiness, the traits of holiness, and he's, he, he uh, initially talks about the, the, the two areas uh, that, that really become important, and one is in the uh, practical practice of it, right? The next is sort of the gradual process toward holiness. He says that a person that then practices what we learned is purity in the several chapters back, and they develop purity, um, they themselves become holy. It's, they become a holy vessel. And he explained, he talks about how that individual becomes the chariot of Hashem. Think about that for a chariot of Hashem. And there is, uh, the question was asked, why did he not use the idea of Beis HaKadosh or the house of Hashem? Why a chariot for Hashem? Well, it's interesting because the idea of a king's chariot the king's chariot, it becomes part of the king, right? Whenever the king is in it, he, that's his chariot. And wherever the chariot goes, there goes the king. And so in many aspects, a person who is practicing purity, who is a holy person, um, and does holy things, they actually become the carrier of the king to the people around them, to individuals around them. So the king rides upon... Uh, the holiness of the Sadiqim. Um, in accordance with the dictum of the sages of blessed memory, found in Barashit's Rabbah 47, 6, it says, addressing the verse that states that Hashem spoke to Avraham, Hashem rose up from upon him, Barashit 35, 13. The verse indicates that the Shekinah has been resting, as it were, upon Avraham himself. And the sages explain that the teaches that the patriarchs of the Jewish people are themselves the chariot of the Shekinah of God. The sages similarly state, as see, and we've seen Rashi's Barashit 17.22, the, the, the righteous are themselves the chariot of the presence of Hashem. This analogy uh, appropriate, is appropriate because the Shekinah, rest upon them, just as the presence of God rests upon the Beis HaKmikdash, and thus, since they are like the Beis HaKmikdash and the altar, the food that they eat, it is like offering upon the fires of the altar. Since the physical actions of Kadosh are themselves holy, like offering to Hashem, it certainly cannot be said as with the Tahor, or that is uh, purity, that is that it would be better if we were free from engaging in all actions at all. So let's do a comparison real quick. The idea is that in purity, you want to avoid contaminating yourself, correct? And so it says, you know, maybe it would be better just not do anything so that you don't contaminate yourself. Well, holiness doesn't work that way. The only way that we can really be holy is through our actions. As a matter of fact, we cannot actually demonstrate holiness to Hashem. How can you present your holiness to Hashem when Hashem is the perfection of all holiness? How do, how do we become holy? We can't become holy to Hashem. We become holy by treating others, others with holiness. Does that make sense? It's by our actions that holiness becomes elevated. So, he says that... Um, Just as a person um, presents an offering in the Beis HaKmikdash, when you eat food, you are uh, presenting an offering to Hashem on your altar of fire. This is as taught in the statement of the sages of blessed memory in the Midrash, Tachuma to uh, Parshas uh, Tetzave 13 says, So too, regarding the food and drink that a ho holy person consumes, it is an elevation for that food and for that drink when it is consumed by that person, and it is as if had been offered on an actual altar. A source for this concept is found 
in Kesebus 105b. It says, this is a concept in which the sages of blessed memory allude to when they say anyone who brings a gift to a Torah scholar is regarded as if he had brought uh, first fruit offerings to the Beis HaGmikdash. Similarly, the sages said in Yoma 71a, one should fill the throats of Torah scholars with wine, and it will be considered in a place of pouring libations upon a wine upon an altar. Surely this matter does not mean that the Torah scholars should eagerly pursue the pleasures of food and drink, God forbid, so that others should fill their throats with wine in the same way that they pour food down the throat of a gut glutton. Rather, the concept underlying this statement is understood in the following, the intentions of the physical actions that, is, that are noted. So the idea is if you know that um, you know a, a, a tzaddikim or a righteous person, and like uh, the rabbis, Rabbi Greenbaum and, and Rabbi Wolby, some of these rabbis that teach, then um, when you give a, a gift or contribution or whatever it may be to that individual, it is as if you are giving that or bringing those things to the Beis HaKmikdash. It's an incredible idea. We don't have a temple now. We don't have Haikou and Gadol. So what do we do in its place? It's the reason why many of our actions uh, around Shabbos uh, is reminding us of temple service, correct? Even in our daily activities, our daily prayers, are all surrounding this idea of the, of the uh, Beis HaKmikdash, the temple service, and the holy temple. Um, but since we, if we are practicing levels of elevation and holiness, then our practice of holiness and purity and goodness, then at some level we become an altar to Hashem. And whatever we do and everything we do actually becomes holy in and of itself. And I'll explain that a little bit later on. It says that... Um, that the, the Torah scholars who are holy in their ways and all their deeds are actually on the same level of the Beisek Mikdash and altar. Because the Shekinah rests upon them just as it rests on the actual Beisek Mikdash, thus that a gift of food that is brought and consumed is like that which is offered upon the altar. That, is the, that was the source of the concept of this idea of giving to uh, 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 the king. Although the context of the above statement of the sages was food and drink, this phenomenon applies to all things. And in this way, may understand similarly with regard to any object of, physical, of the physical world that the Holy One may use, since they are already attached to the holiness of Hashem, blessed be He, it is indeed an elevation and benefit for the object that is that it merited to the uses of the uh, righteous person. Um, uh, example, um, I, when a rabbi comes to visit us in our community, uh, it is a great mitzvah to do everything you can to, to take care of them. Now generally, not generally, all, all the time, when that person comes in town, we take care of all of his expenses, make sure that he has want for nothing, um, and it comes out of our funds as a community. But at the same time, uh, we should be clamoring over ourselves to be able to have the opportunity to pick him up and to drive him where he needs to be, to make sure he needs this or that, you know, going above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that person is assisted and taken care of. Why? Because it's a great mitzvah. And in doing so, it is as if you're bringing offerings to the Creator, which is an incredible concept. Um, The, the next idea, this idea that anything that is uh, used or attached to the Zadikim or the righteous uh, itself becomes um, elevated and holy. The, the, you, you remember the idea that when, if a part is holy, if a piece is holy, then the whole is holy. You, you remember that concept? You know, when you, bake, you do challah, you break off a piece and it is to be presented to as on the altar that little piece makes the whole loaf uh, elevated. You understand that concept. With that concept being said, uh, Yaakov, when he laid his head down on the stone, do you remember this? 
when he woke up the next morning after seeing the, the, the vision of the angels coming up and down, that stone was anointed and it became a place of holiness. It became the place to, uh, uh, of Hashem, which is an amazing idea. Um, the Ramchal summarizes the meaning of Kedushah as an example, exampled in this chapter. The principle of the matter is as follows. The essence of Kedushah, that a person be so attached to his God that even during whatever material actions he perform, he is not separated from them and does not budge from them. His attachment to Hashem, blessed be He, this divine uh, attachment is so great that the physical objects that He utilizes for His uh, for all any of his needs is more elevated by the virtue of use of them. Then the degree to which he descends to the level of attachment to Hashem and his elevated spiritual state is by the physical object. So that means that even his physical environment around him becomes sanctified and holy at some level. It's kind of hard for us to comprehend those things, but if you'll remember um, the... Um, Let's look. Let's go back to the laws of purity, ritual purity for the base Mikdash. If you had a kosher animal and it was to be butchered and be put up on the altar, and that animal is touched by someone who touched a dead body, that animal is no longer kosher. Correct? It can't be presented. Well, the opposite is the case as well. That the holy can make the mundane elevated, right? So, for example, a, a person practicing the highest levels of purity and righteousness, when you eat food, it's the lowest level, it's the lowest level, you elevate food to the highest level, right? Food cannot be brought upon the altar unless we bring it to the altar, right? And if you study Torah, then the very food that you eat, you're eating is being elevated to a higher level. It's, it, these, this concept is pretty amazing. So that means that even the things that you use on a mundane basis become part of you becoming holy and being a righteous person. Therefore, you're making those things around you sanctified and holy. Follow? The mezuzah on the door is a perfect example. Perfect example of that. Uh, and then we, can, we, can't rem, we, can, uh, we can't afford to forget how physicality constantly wants to pull us back into uh, the veiled elements of the physical world and not see the Creator. And it's so easy for us, to, it, when we're in the physical world, to think, well, yeah, I study Torah and I do this and that, and we, and we fail to con conceptualize what's happening in the spiritual world. I, I, I wanted to mention this last night in the class. I didn't, just because it, it might have been a little bit too much. Plus, we went on 45 minutes in the class. Uh, but each, each Hebrew word, you know, the, the Hebrew is an amazing language. And we read the creation story and we miss so much just because English just doesn't suffice. But when it is mentioned that he created the earth and he created the firmament and he created the, the skies above the firmament, firmament the word for each one of those levels demonstrates the seven different levels that are in the spiritual realm. So in the same way, so what God is doing, when we say he, he, he cloaked himself or hid himself in physicality, the reason why he does that is because physicality can't like, uh, exist with him there. Why? Because he fills up everything. So he has to pull himself out of this place, build the universe, and then within the universe description, within the Torah, we see him revealing himself. So what God is saying, just like he built the earth, which is the lower level, and everything in the earth, which is the subterranean place of judgment, right? You get that. And then you move one level up, you have the firmament, you have the skies, you just keep going up to different levels. Then we understand that God has all of these other levels. And if we are only in the physical world, we're at the lowest level. If we're caught up in all physicality, we're at the lowest level. But when we go up, for example, to the Shekinah, to the, to the next level of the heavens, right? Shemaim. 
the idea of going to the heavens in spiritual realms is this is what holiness is, is conceptualizing and realizing Hashem has made me holy through His Torah. He sanctified us. So what, how's the, all the prayers go? He sanctified us what through His? Mitzvah. He sanctifies us. So by purely doing the mitzvah, the problem is, is sometimes we get stuck in the physical world. And we're blinded to the fact that we're very spiritual people in a very physical world. Um, let's talk for a moment about of elevating material things to the realm of the spiritual. Um, it says, this ability to elevate material things to the realm of the spiritual is limited to those who have fulfilled the criteria of Kedushah. However, this ability to elevate the physical is possible only when one's intellect and mind are firmly, constantly focused on the Holy One, blessed be He. So, holiness cannot be realized. You cannot elevate the physical world to the highest level until you've constantly been uh, constantly uh, consuming yourself and attaching yourself to Hashem, cleaving to Him. Someone asked a great Chacham of, of Torah study, a great expert in Torah knowledge, what mitzvah do you find the most difficult? And he thought for a moment, he goes, uh, the mitzvah of not thinking of Hashem in the restroom. Think about it. You're like, well, I've never thought about that. It's like, of all the mitzvahs you think would be difficult, that's the one that's difficult. And, and, and every one of us in this room understand what that's like. It's like every time you, you're in that environment, that's where, because my mind is pretty much, you know, you're always kind of like, it's always popping in and out, ideas, concepts, conceptualizing. Then all of a sudden you realize, wow, you know what? My whole day is filled with thoughts of Hashem. So that means your whole day was holy. The idea that, that, um, that our environment becomes the very um, sanctuary of Hashem, the environment that we live, it is the sanctuary of Hashem at all times. And sometimes we have to guard ourselves not to be sucked back into that uh, physical world. It says, um, The Ramchal wants us to uh, wants to remind us that that a person cannot do anything actually to accomplish this highest level on his own. What does that mean? That means that Hashem has to give you his divine his divine uh, unction to do it. But even this can be done only after one already has acquired all the good characters character traits that we have mentioned up to this point. From the beginning of the chapter 2, where we talked about Zerus, uh, the fear of sin, uh, chapter 24 and 25, th th that idea of the fear of sin. Only with this preparation can one enter into the holy and succeed. For if the first traits of, of Zerus, of, of fear of sin, are lacking in him, then he is like an outsider or blemished person. So what he's saying, until you develop the fear of sin, you're not going to be conscious of the Creator at all times. And what, because he says, to accomplish the idea of the fear of Hashem or fear of sin is to constantly be aware of the, the proximity you are in with the Creator and His Torah and His mitzvah. Um, it says that a person who approaches this level of fear of sin, Zerius, and after readying himself to reach this level with all these preparations, that is purity, fear of sin, uh, attention to detail, um, um, uh, having zeal, all of these things have to be the, uh, is the combination that's going to produce holiness. It says, uh, if he will increasingly attach himself with the strongest love and most powerful awe of the Creator, blessed be he, to the comp uh, contempt contemplation of the greatness of Hashem, blessed be He, and the, in, the immensity of His exaltedness, then He will gradually detach Himself from the physical world and all of His endeavors and all of His movements. He will uh, direct His mind purely to the hidden paths of true attachment to Hashem. Once the path 
of Kedusha, once on the path of Kedusha, he will continue to do so until the spark of Kedusha flows from on high. So, here's here's a good analogy. Uh, I want to build um, I want to build a fire. Uh, a fire in itself cannot sustain itself without the fuel. Correct. So think of it this way. All the traits mentioned from chapter 1 through chapter 26, all of the attributes, righteousness and holiness, purity of mind, and uh, attaching ourselves to Hashem and cleaving to Hashem, and, and um, attention to, to details and having zeal, uh, focusing on the matters that is most important. After doing all of that, you realize that you've gathered all the kindling, right? you've gathered all the wood. You've, you've actually layered it in such a way that you are intentionally going to build a fire. And if you've ever built a fire in the woods or something, you know that you have to have uh, something that can ignite pretty quick. It's going to be on the bottom. It's going to help the flames to rise up through the heavier wood that you put on. And then as you sort of layer that, and once you put the spark to that really flammable material, then it carries the flame on higher and it actually ignites the whole uh, fire, a whole uh, a stack of wood. So with that being said, all these things that the Ramcha has talked about up to this point, we are collecting up the kindling, but it is Hashem who has to put the spark there. It's Hashem who has to put the fire on the altar. And if you remember, what happened the first time that the presence of God dwelled on the altar? It said that they put the offering there and then fire came down from where? I'm consumed. The fire came down of heaven, consumed it. So the idea is that we, with intent, pull all these materials together. But it is Hashem ultimately who will light the fire. He lights the candle of our soul. And, and, and so, which at some level, I think, um, takes the pressure off of you. All you need to do is assemble all the components together. The Creator will do the rest. Um, and that, that's, uh, that, that is beautiful. He says, having described the trait of Kedushah and the path of achieving, the Ramchal proceeds to summarize, as he did all the previous traits, the factors, the factors that lead one to Kedushah and those that detract from its attainment. You now see that the way to acquire this trait of Kedushah is through a great degree of uh, abstinence from the physical aspects of the world and an intense study of secrets of divine providence and the hidden wisdom regarding all of creation and through the knowledge of exaltedness of Hashem, blessed be He in His praises, one cleaves to Him with a great bond and will know how to direct his thoughts to lofty matters of Kedushah, even while, do, uh, while going about and dealing with worldly matters. Just as a Kohen has su supposed to direct his thoughts to specific matters of Kedushah while he is slaughtering an offering on the basic Midash or receiving its blood, its sacrifice, and vessels sprinkled upon the altar, so that through his, this loftiness is the intent while performing the service. This holiness is the kind of holiness that elevates everything around you. Here's the example. You're washing dishes, the most mundane thing that you could do in the household. But yet, while you're washing dishes, you're being reminded of how Hashem wants us to be pure. And you utter a prayer, and, you, and you, in your mind, you're speaking to Hashem. That is the highest level of practice of holiness in your life. It's an amazing thing. Giving mitzvahs is a great thing. We need to do that. But it's that constant attachment to Hashem that elevates you to this highest level. In the conclusion... Of the list of traits, um, let's see. I skipped a part. Um, in association, uh, this association impedes kedusha because the material dimension of Kadosh finds its own kind, i.e., the con connects with the material dimension of those with whom he associates, and is thereby awakened and strengthened. And this leaves the soul trapped in materialism, and it will be unable to escape the imprisonment. 
but by separating himself from such people and remaining alone and preparing himself for the rest uh, for the resting of Hashem's holiness upon him, then on the path that he wishes to travel on, he will be led. And the divine assistance that will be granted to him, his soul will become strengthened within him and to, to conquer his physicality and will cleave to the holiness of Hashem, blessed be he, and thereby attaining perfection. In conclusion, what the Ramchal says is this. When when a person does all the things that he should do, then you'll find and figure out the divine assist. What do we mean by the divine assist? Let, here's, here's an example. Let's say that you uh, constantly have problems with uh, um, angry outbursts. We all get angry, but I'm talking about the angry outburst, right, where you just let somebody have it. And then when it's over, you feel horrible, you... You ask Hashem to forgive you. You go back to the person and say, I'm really sorry. I, I shouldn't have just blabbed out like that. And it seems like you're struggling your entire life to try to come, come to terms with that. A person who begins to elevate himself with all of these traits that Ramchal talks about will one day find out, oh, it's been like 10 months since I've even went off on somebody. Right? And, you, and it's not because you've worked so hard not to do it. Yes, you tried, but you all of a sudden realize you had divine assistance. Something has changed. You guys identify with what I'm saying? Something has changed. I don't know what has changed or how it's changed, but I know that Hashem has given me divine assistance in this. And it's only through the focus of study of Torah, focus on mitzvah, cleaving to Hashem, that those things in the divine assists come. If one doesn't commit himself to the study of Torah, does God give you Torah wisdom? No. That's divine assist. So whenever we study Torah, we commit to doing it, and we live it, and we, we broker ourselves before Hashem. You, know, like, you wake this deal like, God, I'm really working hard on this. I need your assistance. God will bring His divine assistance to bring you to holiness. That concludes the Path of the Just, chapter 26, and we will go to a new...